Shall we start or is this? Uh... Simon, Will, are you, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, sure. Great, great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, today we have on our, um, let's say, Zoom cast, uh, Will and Simon Clark, who are two um, Wall Street journalists. They've just written a, a book called The Key Man on the rise and fall of uh, RF Nakhri, um, most uh, commonly associated with a Braj uh, capsule or a Braj as it was called, which is one of the preeminent uh, private equity houses in the Middle East and uh, in frontier markets. And essentially, I'd like to keep it as interactive as possible. Uh, let anyone who's on the call ask questions and I'll kick it off with, uh, let's say three or four questions. Um, so uh, uh, Simon and Will, thanks for joining. Uh, essentially, I probably wanna start with the background of Arif, um, just to give some color to him. Everyone in the Middle East uh, knows him very well because uh, as I mentioned, abroad is very, let's say prevalent within the Middle East. Uh, there's a lot of sponsorship. Anyone in finance wanted to work with or for Abraj. Um, so uh, yeah, essentially, if you can just give some some background on him. Sure, so, so Arif was born in Karachi in 1960, and he attended Karachi Grammar School, so a private school. Um, he's a good student, very smart. Um, very ambitious. Um, he came from uh, a family which was clearly had enough money to send him to a private school, but he wasn't a member of the, the super wealthy. Um, and I think that was part, possibly a motivating factor in, 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 in his desire to become very wealthy he, later in life. He attended the London School of Economics um, and then he joined Arthur Anderson in London, uh, where he started training as an accountant before getting a job back in Karachi with, a, with an investment bank. Um, he then worked briefly for American Express before moving to Saudi Arabia to work with the Alliant businesses. Uh, then in 1994, he started his first company in Dubai, Coppola Group, which led a successful leverage buyout in around 1999, 2000 of Inchcape's Middle Eastern uh, grocery and liquor wholesaling businesses. Um, and then started a barrage with, with four other entrepreneurs um, who have subsequently been airbrushed out of the the story of the founding of Abraj, but that there were five partners in the beginning. Um, so he built Abraj into a very successful private equity firm after 2002 and moved into increasingly into impact investing, which is typically a form of private equity where the managers say that in addition to making profits for their investors, they can also, at the same time, help solve social problems, whether it's poverty, illiteracy, ele electricity shortages, uh, climate problems. So that, so he was presenting himself as someone who was, a, you know, a successful investor and a problem solver. Um, before the uh, the eventual collapse of the firm, which I'm sure we'll be talking about. Sure. Um, and what exactly, I mean, just to um, say we have to have a disclaimer here, but RF is uh, pleading innocent. Uh, he's still awaiting trial. And although the DFSA has uh, put a, a $300 million plus fine and also found the previous CFO uh, guilty and also fined him, uh, we still have to provide that disclaimer as uh, it's innocent before proven guilty. Um, that's right. So Arif has been, um, and Arif and uh, a number of his former senior executives from abroad have been criminally and civilly charged in the United States by the, the SEC and the Department of Justice. And, and Arif maintains that he is innocent of all these charges. Uh, he's currently living on bail in London, 
his extradition to the United States has been ordered by the UK courts and the UK government. He, he wants to appeal the decision. It's not clear yet if he'll be allowed to. That's how the process works. Um, but he maintains he's innocent of all those charges. One of his fellow former colleagues, Mustafa Abdel Wadud, has pleaded guilty to, to a number of the charges in the US. Yeah, it's, it's worth mentioning in terms of what the charges are. The charges mainly relate to securities fraud, wire fraud, and conspiracy charges. Um, uh, what does that exa exactly mean? As in, like, what is he, or what is Abraj um, allegedly guilty of? So, so we understand there's co-mingling, there's paying for operating expenses. In your book, you mentioned that he also took money out, but if you can perhaps, uh, again, provide some more color on, on the exact uh, claims. Well, the words that an assistant US attorney involved in the prosecution has said was effectively Abraj was engaged in a massive fraud. Um, in terms of numbers, US prosecutors allege that Arif and his co-conspirators misappropriated more than $250 million. Um, liquidators who are tasked with recurring money have put the figure at $385 million. And in terms of what this, this means, this means money that they raised for certain purposes wasn't used for that purpose, for the purposes that they said it was going to be to the investors. And so money was effectively transferred from segregated funds into a central account and then to wherever Arif has allegedly directed it, which includes the, uh, his own bank accounts, bank accounts of his family members and bank accounts of his former secretary as well, a company she ran. So the, so the allegations from the United States are that um, Abraj was effectively insolvent after 2014 and was spending more than it was earning. And so in order to avoid collapsing or bankrupting, bankruptcy for years, the, the firm was moving money out of investor funds, which were, you know, for example, intended to build hospitals in some of the poorest countries on the planet. Um, and instead of being used to build hospitals, they were, the money was being used to pay salaries or expenses or being sent out of a barrage to, to, to Arif's personal accounts. This is, this is the, uh, the allegations. Um, in an investigative feature, which Will and I and a colleague wrote for the Wall Street Journal in 2018, it was published in October 2018, we had already been given bank statements, emails, internal documents, which showed the money being moved around in a way in which it should not have been. And that, that those documents were the, the evidence for our investigative feature in October, 2018. Uh, then in April, 2019, Arif was arrested at Heathrow Airport in London on an arrest warrant from the US. So he was arrested by the British police on behalf of the US authorities. And then the indictment was made public in which um, there was much more evidence of money moving around, but it, that, that indictment also referred to the documents which we had already seen. US authorities did not get those documents from us. We didn't know that Arif was gonna be arrested. Um, it's likely that the US authorities got the documents from the same sources that we got them from, but we didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one of my questions essentially is, what would motivate anyone to misappropriate or even need uh, these kind of funds for working capital? Because he had, let's say at his height, around 14 billion assets under management, in your book, you say he earns around 50 to $55 million. And then if you talk about a two and 20 model, perhaps it was a bit less, uh, but you're talking about fees of around 700 million. Uh, so, I mean, why would anyone, a and he's a self-made man. 
he came, as you said, he came from nowhere. Uh, he was a professional. He, he uh, was a deal maker, very well known in the Middle East. He had built a franchise. He, you know, even if you have a few dud deals or poor vintages, it was such a franchise that it would continue going because people are waiting for seven years. So the next seven years of a PE fund is, is always cyclical. So why would anyone even want to take extra from, let's say, why would he want to kill the golden hoose or need to? Well, it's a good question. And to answer it will require some speculation or expression of opinion, which is not what Will and I do. We are investigative journalists. And this is an important distinction to make. The, the key man in our journalism is not the product of opinion or speculation. It is factually reported work based on primary documents and interviews with over 150 people with direct knowledge of what was happening. 70 of those people who we spoke to were former Abraj employees. So it's not our job to speculate or to really express opinions, but we are human, so it's impossible that there isn't some degree of opinion or subjectivity. So to, to give you an answer, I mean, what the documents show is that Abraj was spending more than it earned. Yeah. And it didn't want to cut back on its expenses. It threw very fancy parties. The Abraj lifestyle, Arif's lifestyle was very expensive. He had a very large yacht, at least one. He had houses all over the world, London, south of France, Dubai. Um, he, and, um, you know, he paid himself millions and sometimes tens of millions of dollars and people get used to a lifestyle and they get used to having certain expectations and so it becomes hard to cut costs and, and change the lifestyle whether it's the lifestyle of an individual or of a firm even if that's the right thing to do it can be difficult and it looks like that was so difficult for a barrage that rather than cut their costs they siphoned money from investors funds then the problem with money which we all know is 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 greed and the risk is that money you know there's this there's the saying particularly in private equity that after a certain after executives have earned a certain amount of money money becomes about keeping the score it becomes a way in which executives compare themselves to other executives. And this is very dangerous because it really shouldn't be used like that. But it can become like that. And it does look like that was partly what was going on at the Brage. The executives were measuring themselves in terms of wealth and quantums of money and getting some kind of gratification, whether it was ego or whatever, out of being able to say we have X million in salaries and X billion under management. Sure. And uh, I mean, who is at fault here? Because post 2008, uh, there's a lot of compliance, there's a lot of regulation, you've got fund administrators, auditors, the regulator, um, you've got to look at your capital uh, requirements over the next four so or six months. So how come this wasn't caught? I mean, it's, it's a very good question. And one, particularly with regards to fund administrator's role, I mean, we, we don't have an answer to. It's unclear as to how Abraj was able to get away with being able to transfer money from funds to wherever they wanted to do. But I think at least the role that the auditors played is, is an interesting one. They had Abraj used KPMG Lower Golf as an auditor on multiple funds that it managed. There was certainly a very close relationship between KPMG and Abraj. So Ashish Dev, who was Abraj's CFO, who has fined a record sum of money last week or the week before for his role at Abraj, moved back and forth between KPMG and Abraj. Um, other members of Abraj's finance team followed on a similar journey, moving back and forth between them. Uh, KPMG chairman's son worked at Abraj. Um, 
and KPMG was responsible for auditing the funds and I mean uh, assuming that a lot of people on this cool work in finance um, they carried out an audit and they didn't find anything wrong and if there was wrongdoing there then maybe they should have done but um, and it's worth noting as a lawsuit that's been filed in Dubai between some of Abraj's investors, liquidators, um, involving KPMG and the role that its audit has uh, has played uh, in in the fraud being able to go on for as long as it did. Yeah, the short answer to your question is a lot of people are at fault at Abraj, at the regulators, at the auditors, at the investors, at Harvard at McKinsey and many other institutions. Um, that's, that's the short answer. Thank you. Um, and I mean, how does an LP or investor today, what do you suggest he, look out, he looks out for? Because, uh, you know, you've had a broad, you've had uh, this big whale from Malaysia, Joe Lowe, you've had NMC, You've had a whole bunch of, let's say, um, things go under, un whether under the cloud, whether at fault, uh, all allegedly, let's just say. But what would an, what should an LP look out for? How does he protect the sanctity of his money? Because obviously, you know, valuations can go up and down, but you should have that that crystal clear sanctity of your money that is not being misused. The the, the Abraj story is document, documented in the key man, shows that LPs had to fight incredibly for basic information about their own money that is just astonishing. So the fact that the investors in the $1 billion Abraj healthcare fund, when they sensed there was something wrong, led by Andrew Farnham at the Gates Foundation could not get um, Abraj to disclose bank statements for the healthcare fund, which contained their money. You know, and when we're talking about like five dirhams here, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, is amazing. I mean, this is the investors' money, and, and the, they could not get straight answers out of Abraj about where their money was, which account it was in, which bank it was in. And, and so, you know, it's pretty shocking. I yeah, mean, if it, I it, my, it took my, for, okay. I think four or five months between the Gates Foundation first asking for a simple bank statement to actually get sent a bank statement. I think they asked for it uh, late summer in 2017 and only received it in December. Uh, December that year and that's a bank statement I mean it's not that difficult to show someone a bank statement with their money in um, and Abraj like the email correspondence between the Abraj executives and the investors in that fund is actually kind of laughable it, they, they literally say like this is we're making this a special exception to the Gates Foundation because our relationship is so good with you that we will actually show you a bank statement. And then the bank statement they showed them was a bank statement from three months before, which showed the bank balance on one particular day, which is when Abraj had, unbeknownst to the investors, actually borrowed 224 million from Air Arabia to mask the fact that there wasn't actually any money in, in the fund's account. I mean, if I, keep, if I call up my bank where I may keep, you know, a thousand pounds of savings and say, can I have a bank statement for my account? My bank says, no, we're not going to send it to you. Maybe we'll do it as an exception. You know, we all understand that's an outrageous thing to say. It is equally outrageous for a private equity firm to say that to an investor because it's their money. We're talking about very, very simple, basic stuff here. We don't have to be a Harvard MBA to understand that it's unreasonable for an investor not to be given an accurate statement of where their money is. You know, mm -hmm. Then beyond that, I, I think it's crazy that LPs in private equity funds in general 
never see the accounts of the GP. I mean, if I was going to hand over $500 million of pensioners' money to a bunch of people that want to earn millions a year, I would like to see the, the financial statement for the GP, please. And it's not just a branch that didn't share those documents. It's, it's pretty most private equity firms. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the you know, private equity industry would think that's an outrageous thing if they were, had to do that. And they don't want to do that. But I don't see why that's such an unreasonable request either. And one, one more thing on that. There's a question in the chat box was what was the outcome of due diligence fact finding by consulting firms? So, Aaron, you asked the question how LPs can protect their money. So mm -hmm. a lot of big US pension funds are very short staffed and have very small investment teams. And they have a lot of capital to deploy. And it's quite difficult to do extensive due diligence on every manager they give money to. So what a lot of them do is employ consulting firms to do this due diligence for them. In the case of a number of US investment uh, investors, US public pension funds, they used Hamilton Lane, which advises on hundreds of billions of dollars of assets. Um, they were responsible for carrying out due diligence of a branch. And I mean, Hamilton Lane are meant to be one of the most sophisticated investment firms in the world, which is why they're paid to carry out due diligence. They produced a, a due diligence report, which was over 100 pages long, and they found absolutely nothing. And this, this due diligence report was carried out, I think, in 2017 or 2018. And Hamilton Lane had actually been invested for a few years. So they'd had a few years to get to know the firm what it did, who it was run by, they found absolutely nothing wrong. So in answer to your question, it's probably very difficult for US investors, for instance, to find anything wrong if Hamilton Lane can't in four years of having a relationship with someone. But then maybe Hamilton Lane just aren't asking the right questions and didn't ask the right questions. Because other investment consultants that I've spoken to that met a branch actually did find red flags there and advise their clients not to invest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, sorry, go on. Um, I mean, your book is very much different than Icarus, which is by Brian uh, Brevity. And he says that it's more of a political conspiracy between the, the growing tensions between the US and China, because um, essentially you've had 2008, I think one person allegedly went to jail. Uh, banks have been fined for dealing with sanctioned countries, but big whales, fat fingers, um, a whole bunch of things. But 291 years is what RF may face should he be found guilty. So isn't this a bit, let's say, um, on the extreme side? I mean, why are people really after him? Whereas all these banks, big bulge, blue chip, have just got away with fines and you don't see those, those uh, CEOs, uh, you know, at Her Majesty's uh, pleasure. You're, you're very right when you say that our book is very different from Icarus for a number of reasons. Most significantly, we checked our facts and the author of Icarus did not. It's full of errors, including about us and our reporting. And we also give people an opportunity to comment before publishing and writing about people which is something that the author of Icarus did not do. We have written to the publisher of Icarus um, to point all these errors out. And we got an email back saying that we will hear from them in due course. That was over a week ago and we have not heard from them. Now, um, there is obviously a lot of geopolitics in the world and there's a lot of geopolitics in the Middle East and in Pakistan. But to write a book about a theory for which the author himself admits he has no evidence is a very strange thing to do in our opinion. We, we can't write what the hell we want. It wouldn't get published. We also, you know, as we make clear in the book, we did have 
information provided to us by, by anonymous whistleblowers, people who we still do not know who they are. Now, we could not use that information to, to write articles or a book. Okay, so these people told us, we think this is going on, so it gave us an idea, but then we had to go take that idea and find evidence as to whether or not it was true, which included asking a Braj, included asking Arif Nakfi, is this true? And if they told us, no, it's not true, and they gave us a reason, and we could see that their explanation was not true, then we're not gonna write it up because it's not true. We have spent over three years, day in, day out, trying to report the truth. And that, that is our job. That is what we have done. Um, now, there are many, many injustices in the world. There are, the world is full of injustices. We are journalists. We believe that by telling, finding and telling facts fairly and accurately, we can help to make the world a fairer place. That's our contribution. Um, we are not judges, we are not prosecutors, we are not investors, we are journalists. And um, we take our jobs very seriously and we ask ourselves questions like, are we getting this right? Is someone telling us something because they have a personal reason to be misleading us? How do we know this is true? Or how do we know we're not being lied to or misled? This is a part of our job. You know, one of the biggest injustices in the world is, is economic inequality. You know, the fact that people in North America or Europe earn average incomes of $60,000 a year and people in Africa and South Asia earn $1,000 a year or less is, is a real problem. Now, raising money and saying that you're gonna help make the world a fairer place and then stealing it is a great injustice. And that is what the judges are going to have to decide upon, uh, not us. Um, there, you know, certainly I agree that it is really quite, quite strange, quite outrageous that no bankers in North America or Europe went to jail after the global financial crisis. I, I agree on that point, but two wrongs do not make a right. The sins of the West do not justify the sins of the East. And we need to be clear about what's going on here. Um, my wife is Palestinian Italian. I, I, I have no time for racism. I'm not a racist. If someone's gonna accuse me of being a racist because of the key man, then I think we need to look at their, um, their evidence and their agenda. So I don't think uh, anyone's going there, but it's more in terms of why him, as in, like you said, two wrongs to make a right or whatever, but essentially it does seem very extreme on his end that he's facing 291 years and those who were involved in the crash or subsequent uh, issues in the financial world are simply paying these fines and moving on with life. But I think you've answered uh, that question at least. Well, just, just to add one more thing. What, what sets Abraj apart from other financial controversies is the amount of evidence. So we are regularly told, hey, there's commingling at this firm, that firm. And we're like, we, we say to people who tell us that, show us the evidence and we'll write the articles. I mean, both of us have written very, very critical articles about British or American private equity firms over the years. I have never seen the documented evidence that alleges to show a private equity firm is literally stealing American government money that was intended to build hospitals in Pakistan and Kenya. I've only seen that evidence in one instance, and that's a branch.
Yeah, I mean, if, if anyone's got any evidence of any Western firms doing what Abraj is alleged to have done, then please, please reach out to us after this call, because we'd yeah. love to write more articles about Western firms doing it. Yeah, we'd be delighted to write those articles. Yeah, if Blackstone had been doing that, it'd be fantastic. I mean, that'd be... Great. Um, and I mean, you said you've met uh, Arif, um, you've spoken to many people. What made him so magnetic? Because essentially, there are a lot of people looking for funds. Um, everyone has a great idea, whether it makes money or in the ESG space or in social uh, economics or, or whatever it is. But what drew people to him? You know, even when you speak to people in a broad, it was like a family. So people felt loyal to him. They liked to uh, essentially work for him. So what, what made him so different? He's clearly a very capable man. He's very intelligent, very articulate, and um, he's very capable. I mean, he's done, he built a firm. He, he did, did, did good deals. Um, so I think that's, that's important to acknowledge. Um, but, you know, the evidence the fact he's been. from from Pakistan though, and had worked in Saudi Arabia and worked in Dubai. When he went when he went to pitch investors and said, "Hey, you know, I can invest money into these countries and make money for you, and I've done it successfully before." I think the fact that he was actually from the places he said he was going to invest gave him a lot more credibility than some bloke that went to you know was born and raised in New York and went to university in Boston. And then that's like 300 million people as in like what made him different because it, there are a lot of Pakistanis, Indians and so on in the investment field but what made him different specifically well, beyond that? I, th I think the, me the message that he kind of struck upon, I, I mean his early successes, he clearly was very smart. He made a billion dollars in a year on one deal. I mean that is, I mean, amazing to, by anyone's standards, wherever you're from. Um, but I, I think the message that he kind of, the message that he adopted, the doing good and making money was a very smart pitch. I think added to that, he was an amazing networker. So he had this incredible network of people that he knew from Bill Gates to the Clintons. I, he, I mean, he literally knew people in very important places, institutions all over the world. And I think once you become associated with people who are deemed to be successful whether in, it's in politics or in finance then i think that to an extent rubbed off on him and i think people thought when he was signing you know warren buffett's giving pledge they're like oh, wow this guy is a serious player and so i think the credibility he built amongst you know the global elite effectively was was what really kind of it, it became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that people would just see who he hung out with, who backed him, who had invested in his funds. And, and that really helped him raise more and more money. Yeah, he put a lot of time and a lot of money into, into crafting a public image for himself and, and abroad. It takes a lot of money to turn up at Davos every year and get the amount of public airtime that Arif got, for example. And it takes a lot of thought to, to craft, uh, you know, a narrative, things to say at Davos that convince people you can invest their money in a way that will make money and do good. Abraj put a lot of resource into, into that communication. You know, a lot of private equity firms, you know, they generally, especially between 2002, 2008, they, they were not public. They didn't talk publicly. Abraj always was very focused on its public image and in, in, in developing that public image. Do you believe the private equity model is the appropriate model for impact investing? Because as you said, one of his uh, USPs was, I'm gonna make you money, but I'm also gonna make the world a better place. But here you've got um, multiple conflicts of uh, the, the fees, the type of people who are in private equity and the type of outcome people want. Um, 
do you feel that there is a better model uh, for this? And do you feel that the P model in, in itself is not the best model? I think that's an excellent question. And I think that a lot of thought and discussion needs to be put into that um, by people who are sort of better placed than ourselves as journalists. But I do think that the 10 year blind fund is not, especially a, a leveraged buyout fund is definitely not the best structure to invest in developing economies like like in Central Africa. I mean, for a start, if you're a buyout firm, you need to, to acquire large established companies. And there are not that many large established companies in some markets, but there's a huge amount of entrepreneurialism and incredibly brilliant people in all countries. And so in many ways, these markets is better suited to venture capital type model where you plant small seeds, you invest a million dollars, $5 million in, in, in an entrepreneur and over five, 10 years that grows enormously. Even with venture capital funds, they're usually, they're not transparent. They don't disclose information publicly. I do think that's a problem. I think that private equity enjoys more secrecy than it deserves. And it would be better for everyone if there was more transparency around private equity and venture capital because then it's less hard to hide things if they go wrong and sometimes people hide things not because they're doing something wrong but because they're embarrassed that it didn't go as they intended and then maybe they in order to hide the fact that they've hired as hidden a small problem that they, they they make a bigger problem so you know Venture capital, private equity, the people in these markets are very skillful, very knowledgeable, but maybe there are better structures, whether it's deal by deal or transparent, more transparent capital structures. Maybe there are better capital structures and ways of investing money in, in developing economies and, and you know, in, in the UK and the US as well. And uh, I mean, that's all the questions for me personally. But uh, I can see in the chat group that there are quite a few, so I'm going to go through them. Um, so, why did the British judge change his mind from granting no bail to granting a bail of 15 million? And who's paying for a the bail and for these expensive lawyers? Well, uh, good question. The the judge at the time that the, the, the questioner is asking us about, had, it, had, an, it had, had declined bail. And then the next we heard the judge had awarded bail in, in return for a bond of 15 million pounds. So it sounds like it was the, the sheer amount of money offered, which convinced the judge to, to award bail. Um, Where's the money coming from? We don't know exactly. I mean, the, 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 the sources of, of Aris money are, are still a mystery to us. Mm -hmm. But if he's not found guilty as yet, does he have, is his money frozen or is, it, uh, is he free to do what, it, what he wants with it? Well, the bail money, so the 15 million pounds that he's, he has to hand that over to the court and as long as he um, complies with the conditions of his bail, at the end of his bail period, he gets that money back. So assuming he is going to go to the United States, when he goes to the United States, he would get that money back from the UK court system. I think then you know he would want to be on bail in the United States. He doesn't want to be in, quite understandably, does not want to be in prison before his trial, and he doesn't want to be in prison after his trial. But to stay out of prison before the trial, he will need to pay more bail money. Um, yeah. Sure. And uh, what kind of anecdotes uh, can you give us of 
of the time of abroad because there are some pretty good ones that you've written in your book but what did you have to leave out well the stuff we had to leave out we had to leave out for, for good reason because our lawyers um would not let us include it and so it would probably be prudent not to share those stories um or, or now, share one but, that was in the book for those uh listeners who, who uh, haven't read it yet there is who, who will be buying story. it uh, after this some some amusing stories concerning concerning Aris former secretary um which may be of interest to some people once you've read the book uh feel free to email me and i can maybe go into a bit more detail then um but yeah i i don't know i, I think in terms of stories i i think literally throughout the whole the thing that i personally found most um kind of incredible about the whole story was just how there was such a contrast between what Arif was saying and doing in public and what was going on behind the scenes and so there's this one occasion January 2018 before we've even published our first story where Arif is sitting on a panel at Davos in front of a large audience with Bill Gates. Bill Gates at the time knows that there are issues with a hundred million dollars of his foundation's money. And Arif sits on stage and tries to engage Bill Gates in conversation for pretty much the whole panel. Bill Gates is not happy. You can just tell by his body language that he does not want to engage. And then there comes a point at which Arif actually manages to get him to buy it at one stage. And Arif lectures Bill Gates on a point that they were debating about. And all the while, he must just be sitting there thinking, what is going on? Like, I, I've, I've allegedly taken my, like $100 million of this guy's money, yet he still has the balls to, to lecture, like one of the world's richest, most powerful men, which and there are many instances of this. There's another conference where he gives a huge speech about corporate governance and how he would never dare um, you know, do anything wrong in terms of mismanaged investors' money. And then he literally walks off stage. And then we have evidence to show that, you know, he directed someone to take money that he wasn't entitled to. And he managed to do this for, for nearly five years. And that to me is is the most extraordinary part of the whole book and the story, just, just how he managed to keep it all going for so long. I, I've got a story. So, um, so in April 2019, Arif's flying from Pakistan to, to London. He goes via Doha because if he goes via Dubai, there was a risk that he would be arrested because there were some legal issues in Dubai, some checks had bounced and that's a criminal offense. Um, so he's avoiding flying by Dubai, he arrives in London he gets off the plane and a British policeman walks up to him and says, you're under arrest. And, and Arif replies to the policeman, you can't arrest me. And the policeman says, well, why is that? And he says, and Arif's answer is because I checked with Interpol before I left and there's no red notice for me. A red notice is like an arrest warrant. Now it's important to note at this point that Arif was on the board of the Interpol Foundation, which is a, a foundation which tries to raise money for Interpol. So, and because of that job, he had an Interpol passport. And on the board of the Interpol Foundation, he sat next to Carlos Ghosn, who has subsequently also had his problems with the law. You know, he tried to escape a trial in Japan by being secretly flown out of the country in a black box. So, so, so at some point you have Arif and, and Carlos who are sort of part of the global police infrastructure, which is an amazing decision. I don't know who selected them and why, but anyway, they did. So anyway, Arif says to the policeman, you can't arrest me, there's no red notice. And the policeman says to him, I don't need a red notice you're under arrest. And then he hands over four passports to the policeman, two Pakistani passports, the Interpol passport, and the, the St. Kitts and Nevis passport, and a list of seven phone numbers. One of the phone numbers is the phone number of 
Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. So this is someone who's really at the center of a very powerful global network of contacts, who's finally sort of getting into trouble with the law, which is not a nice experience for anyone. After he was arrested, he was sent to Wandsworth Prison in South London, which is not a nice place to be, and he did not, ha not have a nice time there. It's, it's not, not good for anyone. But it was quite, that was quite a moment, right? I was told, and this is not in the book because we didn't get enough sourcing, but we were told that when he was on the plane before being meeting the policeman, he'd been called to the front of the plane and he thought he was gonna get VIP fast tracked through passport control, uh, but he wasn't, he was gonna get arrested. So that's not in the book, that detail. Thank you. And um, do you think your next story is on the board of Interpol? I think there's a book about Davos. There's a book about Interpol. <laughs> there's a That's book about written. McKinsey, about Harvard. You know, there are, yes, ha Hamilton Lane. But Davos mm -hmm. and Interpol, inter definitely worthy of books. Sure. And uh, just going through the questions. I understand that uh, the whole the whole co was leveraged, and this is not a, a normal structure. Um, do you think that it was the reason that it was leveraged was part of the uh, the impact of, of Abraja's downfall? And uh, what should other PE companies do to not uh, be stuck in such a quandary in a liquidity crunch? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. The hold co was significantly leveraged, but so were other parts of a barrage. I mean, there were all sorts of cross claims and leveraging of assets and re-leveraging of assets. Um, it really was a, a very, very complicated structure at the end. And that, that, that no one should do that. I mean, yeah. in, in, in the old, you know, 20 years ago, it was, normal for private equity firms to have no balance sheet at all. They just had funds that they managed and the, the, the private equity teams would, would, would yes, they would get a, a management fee, which wasn't huge, and, and they would get their share of carry. And th that was the most important way for them to get compensated through carry because the argument was that they, if they got them reward through carry, they were aligned with the investors who they were investing on behalf of. But now it has become more common for private equity firms to have balance sheets. So more of them have become publicly traded companies with balance sheets like KKR and Carlyle and, and Blackstone. Um, I mean, I guess if you manage your balance sheet prudently, it's not a problem. But if you over leverage anything, it, it can be a problem. The one thing that was unusual about and interesting about Abraj is that year after year we would get press releases and they would it would always say, I think, as the part of the press release, that Abraj has a balance sheet of $1.5 billion. And that, that amount never changed, you know, year after year. And we had no, no visibility on what that balance sheet was exactly. So again, it comes back to transparency about disclosing information properly. I mean, yeah, maybe you can leverage the balance sheet a bit as long as you do it prudently and you're transparent about it. And uh, have you ever met uh, Arif? I mean, what are your thoughts of him personally? I, I haven't met him personally. I've spoken to him on the phone for a few hours and he was very evasive and didn't answer any of the questions that I had for him. But I think I think Simon's had the, had the pleasure. Yeah, I, I, I've met Arif a couple of times, most significant, and I, we, I, we write about one of those meetings in the Key Man. I met him in, in, in Dubai in 2007. Um, I interviewed him in his office in the end. Um, I, I'm very, I personally, we're, look, we're, we're sad about how Abraj ended. When, when Will got this anonymous email saying 
there's problems at a barge. And he came over to me and said, well, the source has said 200 million missing. And then, you know, as we reported this out, it was just sadness, you know, all things being equal, we would want a barge to be a success. What, what's, what's not to like about a multinational, multi-ethnic investment firm, which says it has the best practices and that it's investing to make money for pensioners and whoever, and to end poverty. What's not to like about that? That's great. So it was very sad that it turned out that there was a big difference between what Abraj was saying and what it was doing. Um, but, you know, all things being equal, we would have loved to see it be a success and work. I mean, we, we've, we've done our reporting, we've done our investigating, we've asked ourselves difficult questions, we've asked other people difficult questions. This is not personal, this is professional. And we're sorry to see what's happened and we hope that lessons will be learned that will help the whole industry, impact investing, private equity, do better. I think it is important that people talk about this. It's why we're grateful to you, Aaron, for, for inviting us to talk. It is important to talk about this, really understand, hear different points of view, and, and take learnings from that and implement them. The worst thing that can happen here is that people just pretend nothing's happened and don't want to talk about it, which has kind of been what's happened until the key man was published. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, uh, I know you, you suggest, uh, someone has just written that uh, effectively that the Americans were supportive of, uh, of Roger's investment in uh, Karachi Electric. And what was the position of the US diplomats when Abraj was trying to sell it to the Chinese? Is there any, um, situation there which uh, which led to the because had he sold Karachi Electric then he would have had enough money to roll over pay back any plug any holes um, and move on was that's any... not true that's not sorry Aaron well, I'm going to answer your question that's not true that's what Arif says but that doesn't make it true and as, as we've discussed about how people run fund management businesses I've never heard of a PE firm in which you have to rely on the sale of one asset in order to keep the whole firm going. So that is an argument that if Abraj had been able to sell that, the firm would have been fine, is a total fantasy. And then on to the next part about uh, the US involvement. I mean, we've subsequently, and Simon's led on this, reported out what, and this isn't in the book because Simon only managed to get this confirmed after the book came out, but Simon's reported out what actually happened with regards to Karachi Electric. And the so part, part of it is in the book. We, we, we make clear that um, there were real problems with Karachi Electric, which people were not transparent with. Again, finances. So Karachi Electric had huge liabilities. It had basically a giant unpaid gas bill to the state gas supplier. There was a problem of circular debt in, in Pakistan. Karachi Electric was owed money by the, the municipality of Karachi, the water company of Karachi, and in turn, it owed money to the, to the gas company. And, and these liabilities, there were civil servants who, whose, whose consent was required for the sale to complete. And, and one of them is, is named in the book, a, a policeman, Bashir Memon, who said, we, you know, there's a problem here. These, these problems need to be solved before this transaction can be completed. Now, as Will mentioned, I have spoken to other civil servants in, in recent months who've explained what happened. And the reason the transaction was not approved was because the barrage was not transparent with the civil servants. It would not give them the information that they asked for. And so it was 
very difficult for them to approve the transaction. There is lots of evidence of a Braj pressuring Pakistani politicians to push this transaction through. There is no evidence of Americans or anyone else pressuring the Pakistani government to block the deal. Yes, there is geopolitics in Pakistan. There's no evidence that it affected the sale of Karachi Electric. Yes, there were some American officials who were surprised, annoyed when they were told that Abraj was planning to sell Karachi Electric to Shanghai Electric. It mainly caused an issue for OPIC because OPIC had agreed a loan to Karachi Electric, but OPIC cannot lend money in China or to Chinese owned assets. So they had a technical problem. So, okay, well, we can't lend this money anymore. But there is a huge investment that's been put into this narrative, which has no evidence that the sale was blocked by an American conspiracy, which is the subject of the, this other book that you mentioned. We don't think it serves anyone's interests to promote news for which there is no evidence. I think that's, that's fake news. Yes, there may be facts and information that Will and I don't know about, and, but that's different from actively writing a theory for which we have no evidence or which we know is not true. Is, you know, it, people should need to be responsible for what they say in public. We can't say whatever we want, uh, and we won't say whatever we, we think because it's not responsible. We, we say what we can show to be true. Sure, I think, uh, no, it's been very uh, enjoyable uh, having this chat and uh, very informative. Uh, we, we hit the limit in terms of 100 people. I wasn't expecting it in this uh, zoomed out space. Uh, but I'd like to thank you personally, and I'm sure all the listeners would like, uh, would you like to end on a parting uh, note uh, as we close this off? Yeah, I'd, I would like to say one more thing, that there is, there is a counter narrative to the key man, where people, particularly in Pakistan, are being encouraged to see Arif's problems as a consequence of him being from Pakistan. And what I would say to those people is that the problems of Arif Nakfi belong to Arif Nakfi. The problems of Arif Nakfi do not belong to Pakistan. Pakistan is an amazing country, wonderful people. I lived there for a year in 1994. I had the privilege of living and teaching there. And people need to just look at what's going on, ask themselves, why is this journalist or writer telling me what they're telling me? And what is the source of their information? Yes, we believe in free speech, but we also believe that people should check their facts and tell the truth. And so just as we go forward, it's like important in this story to, to really understand what's going on here. We don't have all the facts, but we've shared with you here and in the book, the facts that we do have. And, and also how we know them. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for uh, such an informative uh, chat. And thanks everyone for joining. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Aaron.